And uh, uh, let's start with the uh, MEA session. So ask me anything session. And we have almost uh, 20 minutes uh, to explore in depth uh, uh, the perspectives, uh, the ideas uh, coming from uh, the debates and the uh, uh, different sessions that we had this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, let me introduce uh, the three participants who so will start this final session with their questions. Uh, uh, are you there? So let, let's start with uh, Chiara Diana. She's the Executive Design Director at Frog. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chiara. Good afternoon. Sorry. Oh. Oh, okay. Hello. Sorry. Hi. Good afternoon, Chiara. Uh, Alessandro Via, uh, he's the head of service design at Generali Italia. Good afternoon. Hi, Alessandro. hello. Then Giulia Spagnoli, uh, UX and service designer, head of insights center at uh, KPMG. And then we have our three, uh, our three uh, prominent guests, Roberto Verganti, Jean Yetka, and Carlo Ratti. So uh, nice to meet you again. Uh, I want to leave the floor to Chiara Diana. Uh, she will start with the first question to Roberto Verganti. Please, Chiara. Thanks, Francesco. So um, thanks for the presentation, Roberto. I'm a strong believer, and now I would say even an age practitioner of putting human needs at the center of the innovation process. And I think that this is not only, as you also mentioned, to solve the problems, but really about expanding the human potential. What, what I want to reflect on is if with this kind of spike in the design thinking, sometimes this is a buzz, sometimes it's real adoption, is there an over-reliance on its uh, self-sufficiency to drive innovation forward? Are we underestimating technical, scientific, other expertise? And so the question to you is more about in your interaction with this community, in your research, in your experience, how design thinking in the practice is really interplaying with other methods and innovation paradigms? Uh, this is very, very, uh, very in interesting question. And I think we can go back to the data also that, that Claudia showed before. Uh, um, I, my feeling is that it could interact more. <laughs> uh, just to go to the final point. I mean, we, can, we can see it in the data of, uh, of Claudia. It was very interesting to see that uh, the way uh, design thinking is entering into other practices from the innovation manager is it, it is, I mean, there, there is a, a significant adoption, whereas where you start from design thinking, you it's almost look like you're a little bit more closed to other contribution. Uh, so, and, and this is the same thing we have been measuring in this uh, special issue of, of the Journal of Product Innovation Management. We, we were asking to the scholars of this, uh, these 190 scholars uh, to connect what is being discovered design thinking to other theories of innovation. And the result, I have to say, was quite disappointing. Uh, it's looks more like, in a way, we are replicating inside a kind of monastery of, of a discipline in which we talk among ourselves. Uh, and uh, without being very open, you know, it's always happening when there's a kind of hybris, you know, that they are, an approach is, is very successful. So you don't need anything else. You're, you're, help, you're happy about yourself. Uh, I think this is a little bit of a danger uh, because uh, as long as you are open to other things, you can reno and renovate yourself. When you don't, you are not open, then you slowly, slowly, slowly dry up. So it, this is an invitation to all of us scholars, and practitioners, to always be open uh, to work in collaboration with others. Even if the, we say that design is working in collaboration with others, we there are different ways to collaborate and we 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 always present design as the as the integrator in the middle that's not the easy ways to collaborate with others because we need to be ready to be not always the integrator but one of the players with someone else integrate 
Okay, so thank you so much, Roberto, and thanks, uh, Chiara, for your uh, very interesting question. So let, let's start with the second question from Alessandro Via to Jean Yetka. Please, Alessandro. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. And uh, um, Jean, I would like to um, take a concept that Professor Venganti mentioned, which is um, multiple stakeholders, and connect it to uh, three points that you touched uh, earlier which are the systems that we work within, the strategies we design, and the ethics involved in that. Because uh, as we face global uh, wicked challenges, as the professor mentioned, uh, such as climate change or rising inequality, the concept of uh, user-centered design can somehow feel uh, a little too narrow, okay? And uh, when we're working within um, uh, a shift, let's say, from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, do you think there's a way, and how do you think we uh, could expand or evolve design thinking in order to involve a broader variety and diversity of stakeholders in the design process without slowing it down or clogging it up? And how do you make sure that what comes out of it could be defined as ethical, in a way? Well, thank you for your uh, your question, Alessandro. It, 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 I've had the most interesting last 20 minutes listening to Roberto speak uh, and uh, thinking about how to answer that question. And I often, uh, well, one of the things that it, 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 it lend, leads me to think about is, is, am I just a total optimist? And so I imbue design thinking with a set of capabilities um, uh, that are the ones that I want to see as part of its potential than, that are really there in the world of practice. Uh, because when I look at, at where I would put design thinking in the two by two matrix, I would very much put it already as a reflective, as a reflective practice that is suited for multiple stakeholders and is essentially about making sense of a complex environment. Um, for me, that's the whole point of speaking of design thinking's social technology. Um, I think in some ways it's the narrowness to which design thinking has been used in the business world that has been this notion that what it's really good for is creating exciting new products and services. For me, the real superpower of design is and always has been its social technology, its ability to make possible a future by overcoming the human barrier of how we talk with each other. And I think as part of that, I, I, see, I see two elements there. One is, if we envision this future of stakeholder capitalism, and, and stakeholder capitalism is something we talk a lot about at Darden because I'm privileged to uh, have a close colleague of Ed Freeman, who's probably one of the foremost thinkers about stakeholder capitalism in the world. Um, how do we use design thinking? To me, design thinking is the perfect fit for that world because what is the critical job to be done for a business model of successful stakeholder capitalism that makes possible both profits and work towards the common good. For me, it's the ability to surface and leverage in productive ways a diversity of perspective. And it's the structured dialogue that design thinking brings that allows us to create the conditions for the emergence of higher order solutions to these really messy systemic problems. So for me, it is the reflective practice. It is the ability to work across difference. And it's coupled, to bring up your point on ethics, with a fundamental ethic of care that to me is the underlying philosophy of design thinking. Um, a long time back when uh, I studied a lot of business ethics, I was always intrigued by the feminist notion of an ethic of care. And we might contrast that with a, a more Kantian view of there are rights and wrongs or a more utilitarian ethic of the greatest good for the greatest number. What an ethic of care brings into an organization is this notion of a focus on respect for and the development of individuals and at the same time, an acknowledgement of the larger system we always operate in. 
And this notion of an ethic of care is not articulated very often in design thinking, but the systems and processes make that real. And so as we look at what design thinking makes possible, to me, and in my research, I see this very much as we study design thinking projects and action. Uh, they build trust, they build a shared sense of purpose, they build engagement, and they build optimism for a better future. So, so in many ways, putting on the hat of a strategist, what are the critical strategic capabilities that have to do with actually creating and then enacting a new vision of the future? It's, it's that ability to tell the truth about current reality, but not in the traditional sense of metrics, more in the sense of who are the people we are designing with and for and what is their subjective reality and how do we together align around a shared reality um, and a new future that 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 shared reality envisions as an exciting possibility, right? And then how do we use a continual process of experimentation with a portfolio of new possibilities to ferret out which ones really work in the real world and which ones don't? And so when I put on my strategist hat, I think design thinking is really about building a set of strategic capabilities that if done well, not only allow us to build towards the common good, they may in fact be the most powerful source of competitive advantage in a world of ongoing change. So I think that's, that's, that's to me how systems and strategy and ethics kind of come together around the richness of of one possible view of what design thinking is capable of. So thank you so much, Jean. Um, so let, let's start with the, another question to uh, Carlo Ratti coming from uh, Giulia Spagnoli. Giulia? It's yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the inspiring insight you have uh, shared with us. Um, so, um, considering the power of design thinking uh, in uh, helping to solve uh, uh, weak problems by placing human beings at the core of the innovation process, and uh, uh, considering it uh, as a framework that uh, creates uh, engagement and makes people co-creators within a process in uh, which they learn by involvement, um, I was wondering uh, if, uh, uh, on a larger scale, uh, design thinking or uh, hybrid design thinking can contribute uh, to create a sense of uh, community and uh, civic sense today, uh, especially in light of the historical context and the global challenges we are experiencing, like uh, pandemic uh, situation and climate change, for instance. Yeah, well, th thanks for asking that. And so, so if I understand correctly, you're saying, you know, can we use this as a way to engage more people in collaborating the design? And I think we certainly can, um, but we also need to pay attention. If you look at people who tried to do participation in the past, many times participation ends up, you know, remember we finished the previous session, we were talking about best practices, you know, which are things we already know. Participation often tends to bring us to existing solutions, because those are the ones we know. Think about, you know, Henry Ford, the famous sentence. You know, he said, you know, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, not, uh, not something totally different. So I think, you know, I think it can be used for that, but probably needs a few additional elements. And one element I think that's very interesting is to be able to be reflective not only like Donald Schoen would say about, you know, reflecting in the practice about uh, how we define the problem and our, you know, the, the baggage we bring to, 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 to the process, but also to be reflective in the point of view of bouncing back and forth and creating feedback loop with, loops with people. Let me say, let me say in a better, in a more clear way. Um, <clears throat> what I'm saying here is that, yes, you know, we can use uh, a, a, this methodology in order to par have people participate more, but we can also uh, allow the testing of uh, prototypes or other things, then people can respond to. 
So not necessarily involving everybody in the design process, but also having some people responding to uh, to what is being tested and to prototypes and so on. And so having this kind of back and forth, this kind of reflective movement, which is a back and forth, a bouncy back and forth, which again is similar to what happens in uh, in nature. And I think that is important if you want to be able to do to really have radical designs. The risk that you have when the risk that you have otherwise is that you might fall back on a more conservative option. But what you can do is, if you, you know, alternatively is, uh, as I said, you know, still trying not to co agree, make sure that everybody agrees on the same thing, but uh, making sure that some different tests are done and people can respond to something concrete. I hope this was clear. But anyway, what I want to say is that uh, in, in a short answer to what you said is, you know, yes, it certainly can be used that way. But we need to pay attention that this doesn't lead us to the minimum common denominator to existing solutions. And in order to avoid that, we can create this kind of reflective bouncing back and forth by putting crazy ideas into the mix and allow people to respond to them. Not necessarily for everybody to design together, but having this kind of uh, bouncing back and forth. Thank you so much, Carlo. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if uh, our participants, they have some other questions uh, for uh, our guests. Uh, otherwise, I can maybe ask uh, some questions. We have almost four or five minutes. Well, uh, the, the, me, while the people think, uh, then uh, I have a comment to what uh, Carlo said, then, uh, Fran uh, Francesca. Then we, okay. we can, can leave one minute to people to think, but then I would like to connect to what he said before. Yes. Beto. Uh, may, okay, but well, maybe I can yes. connect my, my people, where people think. I mean, it, this is very important what Carlos said. I mean, we have in a way the myth of participatory design, and uh, and in reality, in the world of architecture, the, this myth was already there in the 70s. Uh, it's, it, it's not a new dream. Uh, and, and we know how disappointed could be. Uh, and uh, in this moment, I, I'm working with the European Commission, and of course, one of the temptation is to engage uh, citizens in the design of policies. Uh, but imagine that people become politicians for a day is not the way to to real solve the problem we have. So there are these two ways that that uh, one way is, is to have people participate in a design. The other way is, like uh, Carlos said, is to have someone put forward an hypothesis and make people play around with this. Uh, there is a third way, which is uh, the, probably the most practical example is the design of Linux. Uh, uh, Linux, the core of Linux has been designed by just one person, which is Linux Torvald, uh, 40,000 lines of code. But nowadays, the, the Linux is a participatory design, not because it's been designed together by I mean, people sitting around the table at all. Actually, it's been just one person putting down the code. But then everyone in this little piece of, of activity put there a little piece. So, so participatory design doesn't really simply mean that everyone needs to design everything, but simply giving everyone the chance to say, in your sphere of action, not on where you're, you're not, I mean, if you're in the example of citizenship or urban design, I mean, you don't design the, the neighborhood because that's, I mean, why my neighbor should be designed by, by a person who's living in this particular state, but you design the space where you can have an action. You design your garden so that is coherent with the neighborhood. Uh, so uh, in the knowledge of Linux is you design, I don't know, a, a, a driver for a specific printer because that's the printer you master and you want to act there. You don't design the entire Linux. So there are many ways. This is a kind of more distributed way of, of, of participation in design, which is quite interesting and powerful. Uh, yeah, Francesco, maybe, maybe, I, I, I wonder if I could just add a, a, a thought on that to Roberto's and um, Carlos. Um, sure, sure. I, I think that the failure of participation is a failure to create the conditions for the emergence of higher order solutions. I mean, if we if we look at uh, complex adaptive system theory, for instance, we know that these messy changing problems uh, can't be solved with rules. They they have to be solved in conversations that make possible people rising above their own parochial views and the cages that, that you talked about um, in order to see something together that none of them could see individually. 
And so setting the preconditions for engagement, uh, for emergence, which are things like trust building, shared purpose, all of that happens in the early stages of the design thinking process. If immersion, for instance, doesn't happen, if people don't really immerse themselves in the lived experience around some, some area of life they're trying to make better, they will not have the emotional commitment to build trust, to let go of their own perspectives in order to build shared purpose, all of these things. So so the failure, I think, of of this kind of bringing multiple stakeholders together is is not that participation fails. It's that we've put them in the room without doing the groundwork of building the conditions that are necessary for these higher order solutions to actually emerge from the group. When we don't build those conditions and we put a group together, we get what Herb Simon called satisficing, the least worst solution everyone will agree to. So I would argue that design thinking should let us structure those conversations to avoid compromise and satisficing and insist on higher level uh, solutions. But we won't get there unless we invest in the sense making and the immersion and all of the pre-work that has to happen before we move into idea generation. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very. Uh, so these comments are very interesting. So um, maybe we need more time, extra time to discuss <laughs> about all the arguments and so all the, uh, you know, uh, very interesting issues that have emerged from uh, these uh, these debates. Uh, so, but uh, unfortunately, we need to to close uh, this uh, this session. So I'd like to thanks again. Uh, the participants for this last session, Chiara Diana, Alessandro Via, and Giulia Spagnoli, and our prominent uh, guests, uh, uh, Jean Yetka, uh, Carlo Ratti, and Roberto Verganti. Let me conclude with uh, uh, you know, uh, some references uh, to, to design. Uh, Alessandro Confalonieri, um, from doing uh, earlier, say that we need to understand what are the boundaries of the discipline. I'm um, 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 speaking as a designer, no? as, a, as an architect and as a designer. So we need to understand what, what could be, what will be the, the boundaries of, of design. Uh, I agree, partially agree with, uh, with the Roberto when he says, uh, okay, um, design thinking is a managerial uh, paradigm. I, 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 I don't. I don't agree exactly with this. Uh, with this, uh, you know, uh, selection of field, uh, because design thinking uh, belongs to the history of design. Uh, this is what we call in Italian cultura del progetto, no? the design culture. There are, there are too many implications in this idea of cultura del progetto, and, uh, and you can see. All these implications, and I agree with uh, Ezio Manzini, but when Ezio Manzini wrote his uh, very, uh, you know, uh, famous book uh, uh, for MIT Press, uh, Design When Everybody Designs, uh, he excluded the idea of uh, uh, taking back you know, to the roots of design, so and uh, creating artifacts in order to stimulate involvement, engagement, and you know a different way of of facing complex problems, uh, no? so that we we relate to design thinking today. So the importance of artifacts, the importance of defining boundaries, and so on. And uh, let me conclude with you know uh, just quoting uh, a song from uh, REM. Uh, uh, this is a song of 1987. Is the end of the world as we know it, <laughs> and uh, this is related to a love affair, of course. But you know, it's quite interesting because there is also uh, a conclusion. So this of uh, this title, and I feel fine. So I think uh, that designers in, in this uh, historical moment, they feel fine with this, uh, you know, change with this continuous change, and uh, this is, I think. The, the most uh, relevant, uh, let's say, learning coming from uh, design thinking, uh, uh, you know, interpreting design thinking from, from my specific discipline, that, that's design. So thank you so much. I do hope that we'll, we, we will have the possibility to, uh, you know, uh, uh, meet you physically uh, to, to um, continue this very interesting interesting debate uh, about design thinking and the evolution of design thinking. 
And now it's the time for Claudio to close uh, this, uh, this seminar. Thank you.